exhaustion. I want to talk about exhaustion today. Have you ever been exhausted? Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of things make us exhausted. Um, Joey and I decided that we needed a um, shed in our backyard. And, you know, usually the hardest work I do is this right here. <laughs> the life of a pastor. But we decided we could build this ourselves, and so we bought it, and, and Ben helped me bring it home from, from Lowe's. And we got home, and it says right on there that two people can put it together as long as one of them is an intelligent wife. <laughs> and so we went to work, and we worked, and we worked, and, and uh, it comes in sections about yay wide, okay? Well, for starters, we got it part way up, and one of the sections was missing. And so back up to Lowe's we went, and they said, hmm, you're the third one. And I said, you know, before the fourth guy walks out with one, open the box and make sure it's all there. Well, little by little, we worked on that. It took us two days, but we got it done. Boy, was I tired. Oh, every muscle I had ached. And when I laid down and went to sleep after that was all over, I slept exhausted. I think I was mentally exhausted from thinking so hard. I was physically exhausted. Not that it was so heavy. It was just I had to keep doing it, okay? And, um, and, and we know exhaustion. There's all kinds of different exhaustions. In fact, there's three different kinds of exhaustions that we deal with, okay? The first one is a mental f or, or physical or mental fatigue. Physical, mental, it's the same kind of exhaustion. It's just that um, in the case of physical, it's the temporary inability of a muscle to maintain optimal physical performance. I watched the Spurs play. Those guys are in shape, okay? And, um, and, and when they're done with the game, though, they're exhausted, and they're going and sitting in hot tubs and cold tubs and all kinds of things and relaxing their muscles and working with their muscles and getting massages and whatever it takes, okay, to keep them going and to work those exhausted muscles. Mental fatigue is the same. It's the same as physical fatigue, except that it's a temporary decrease of maximum cognitive performance resulting from prolonged periods of cognitive activity. I do more mental work than I do physical work. And so I sit at my desk, and then sometimes I'm just done. I can't think anymore. And, and I'm done studying. I'm done learning. I'm done preparing. I'm done thinking. And, um, and then I'll go home, and my wife will ask me something, and, oh, I have to think. And I don't want to think, you know. I'm just mentally exhausted. The solution, whether it's physical or mental, to that first kind of exhaustion is just simply rest. Whether you're resting your muscles, your, 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 your physical muscles, or whether you're resting your brain, okay? Um, rest is the solution, according to science, for dealing with, with that kind of exhaustion. But there's a second kind of exhaustion. It's emotional exhaustion. It's a state of inner depletion that results from excessive demands or continuous stress. Some of you are in jobs that are just stress-filled jobs. Some of you are in situations in life that are stress-filled situations. Stress is exhausting. And after, after enough stress, you can just lay down and sleep hard as if you worked physically for hours and hours and hours and hours. It wears you to a frazzle. N some normal coping strategies, um, according to, to um, doctors is some people um, disclaim or they deny that that's going on in their life. Other people escape it or try to avoid it by shutting it out and not even thinking about it. Others accept the responsibility and or the blame or whatever it is for the stress that's going on, and they deal with it. They talk about it. They focus on it, and they work with it, okay? But emotional stress is a second kind of exhaustion. But there's a third, and that's what I really want to focus on today, and it's spiritual exhaustion. Spiritual exhaustion is the weariness that comes upon my spirit when I struggle to maintain an appearance that is not in keeping with my spiritual reality. Oh my, how exhausting it is to act like you are something that you are not. To try to be something that you are not to pretend that you are something that you are not. And Paul deals with that right here in our text. The reason I want to talk about it is because of this. Spiritual exhaustion is a joy robber. It's a joy robber. 
Remember, joy is a spontaneous and embodying delight in my spirit when my soul is in fellowship with the Lord. But when I am trying to pretend that I am something I am not, then there is a distance that gets established between the Lord and myself. When I am trying to, to act as if everything is okay when everything isn't okay, my joy is robbed. When I try to act as if I'm perfect, knowing good and well I'm not perfect, but I try to act like it because I don't want anybody to know that I've ever done something wrong, that I've ever acted the wrong way, responded the wrong way, um, done something that the church wouldn't accept. And so I hide it and I deny it and, and I have all kinds of things going on. I become physically exhausted and my joy is robbed. Paul deals with that very subject in this passage of scripture. You guys know Frank Abagnale? Yeah, Frank Abagnale, there was a movie called um, Catch Me If You Can. The movie, I first heard Frank Abagnale back in the, in the 19, early 1990s. Frank Abagnale, at the age of 16, left home and became a great imposter. That's Frank's picture today. The movie, the movie tells some of the story, and of course, they make it into a movie, and when you listen to his own story, there are parts of it that vary a little bit from the movie, but the movie is at least based on a true story. He pretended to be an airline pilot and literally traveled all over the world pretending to be an airline pilot, an instructor at a university for a while. He worked for a hospital as a medical doctor. In fact, he moved into an apartment complex, and they had, he had to put down his vocation, and so he thought, doctor. So then the lady wanted to know, well, what kind of doctor are you, as he was filling out the paperwork. And he thought, hmm, this is a, an apartment complex for singles. I'm going with pediatrician, because that way nobody would be asking me any questions, okay? Pretty soon, another doctor moved in, and they started talking. Well, he has an incredible mind, and so he started going to the library, reading the uh, medical um, digests, and then he would talk to this guy about all these new things that were out to the point that finally the guy didn't, stayed away from him uh, because he was too, had knew too much, and he didn't like how he would tie him up all the time. So Frank Abagnale kind of won out on that, but he ended up as a doctor working in a, in a hospital for a period of time, and as an attorney who was um, working for the state and assigned the responsibility of finding himself. <laughs> Amazing man. A million miles, boarded more than 250 aircraft in more than 26 uh, countries, and that's probably true because I did a lot of traveling. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done this. Which one's the jump seat again? <laughs> I was arrested in 1970 in a little town called uh, Montpellier in southern France. The French prisons were a horrible place. There was a cell where you only had a blanket on the floor. There was a hole in the floor to go to the bathroom. There was no plumbing. There was no electricity. And consequently, when you leave that prison system, it is a true deterrent. I always was an opportunist. That's why I got away with the things I got away with. A lot of kids ran away in the 1960s, but they got into Haight-Ashbury and the hippie scene, the drug scene. Uh, instead, I thought, how do I survive now? I'm 16 years old. I look a little older. I'll use that as an asset. And so I first thing I did was to lie about my age just to get people to treat me as an adult. No matter what it brought me, no matter what wealth or fame it brought me, I would never want to have to experience it again. I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room uh, by myself. The only people I associated with were people who believed me to be their peer, uh, 10 years older than I actually was. And then, of course, it took the FBI about three years to realize that I was a kid and not an adult. And when they identified who I was, I think it was very hard for my mother to comprehend that I was doing all these things because she only knew me as this 16-year-old boy uh, in high school. I could tell you that prison rehabilitated me, but it didn't. I could tell you and take a cheap shot that I was a kid and I made some mistakes and grew up. But the truth is, God gave me a wife, she gave me three beautiful children, she gave me a family, and she changed my life. 
Frank Abagnale says, I cried myself to sleep every night, living as an imposter, trying to be some, pretend to be something that he knew he wasn't. One of the things that the movie, Catch Me If You Can, doesn't bring out is how horrid the prison was, and he almost died there. And Frank went on after he was caught, convicted, sentenced, and served his time to pay back every single penny that he ever stole for, um, throughout that period of, of his time. But he talks about his exhaustion, his exhaustion in pretending to be something that he isn't. Stand together with me as we read the scripture. I'm actually going to read not all the way through 4.1. I'm going to read through uh, verse 4, 15 of chapter 3. So beginning in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you, only let us live up to what we have already attained. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. And so the Christian life needs to have a right posture. We need to view things correctly. We need the posture that Jesus Christ would have us to have. Paul says everybody that is mature needs to behave this way, a certain way. And I'm going to show you in the context exactly what he's talking about. But Paul always speaks of salvation in three terms, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. He always looks at the way things were and the way things are going to be in the future. And I'm going to show you that, that he talks about the glorified body. In the past, I got saved. In the future, I'm going to be glorified. But I'm living in the middle right now. I'm living in the middle. And living in the middle isn't always all that easy. Now, let's go back to the past. The past is all about justification. Justification is actually a legal term. And it comes out of the legal system um, in, the, in the, um, the Roman and the Greek Empire. And Paul uses it as a well-known legal term of his day. And it means the act of declaring a person free from guilt. The act of declaring a person free. Guiltless. Justification is that experience when I come to Jesus Christ and I bow my head before him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Save me. I want to belong to you. When I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, at that very moment, I am justified. I am justified. Some, many have said it's just, just as if I'd never sinned. Okay? I like that. It's a good definition. Just as if I'd never sinned. It's done. It's paid for. It's gone. It is the act of, having, of being declared free from guilt. Paul writes in Philippians 3, 9, having a righteousness that comes from God. See, it's not my deeds. It's not my works. It's not anything I do. It is by faith God's grace applied to my life. Jesus' blood making payment for my sin. I have a righteousness that comes from him, and I am declared free from all guilt. That's a bookend. It's a bookend in our life. There's another bookend, okay? It's glorification. Glorification is the ultimate perfection of believers. It's a very interesting thing here that Paul tells us that he's not perfect. I'm going to come back to that. I'm not perfect. That's news to you, right? I'm not perfect. It's not news to joy, let me tell you that, okay? I'm not perfect. But glorification is the ultimate perfection of the believers. One day, one day I'm going to walk into the presence of my God. And I'm going to stand before the throne. And he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I am going to be glorified. And Paul writes in Philippians 3.21 that he will transform our bodies to be like his glorious body. That is ultimate glorification. It's a bookend. But in the middle of those bookends is sanctification. 
Sanctification is today's life. It's today's progress. It's today's job. It's today's responsibility. It's growing in Christ Jesus. And day by day, I'm being sanctified. Sanctified means to be made holy, to be set apart, okay? And I am being sanctified unto Christ Jesus. Book ends. Justification, glorification, but the, the Christian life is the, is the experience of the sanctified life growing in Christ Jesus. Sanctify is the word um, hagiazo, which means to be set apart from hagias, which means to be holy, to be made holy. It's also the word that we translate saint. Saint. Saint, a saint is not somebody set aside by the Roman Catholic Church specifically, okay? A saint is, is, a, is a person who has been made holy by Jesus Christ. Anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a saint. Now, there are those people that we kind of set in our minds as ultimate saints through, throughout historic times, okay? And we look back and we remember there are names that are above other names in a way because of, of what they wrote or how they lived or who they were, various different things. But the fact is that every one of us in Christ Jesus has been set apart. If we're a believer, if we're a Christian, we are in Christ Jesus and we have been set apart. We've been sanctified by him. We are saints. Sanctification is work. It's work, folks. The Christian life is work. Living righteously is work. Matter of fact, let me be specific. It's hard work. It's hard work. You know what? I don't always want to be sanctified. When I come home, and I'm tired of that. And Joy wants to talk. Boy, I got to tell you, there's times I don't even want to be sanctified. <laughs> I'm patient, but not as patient as I want to be. It's hard work living the Christ life. And it is not hard work being saved. Jesus did all the work on the cross. But living for Jesus moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, can sometimes be very hard work. It's work, it's hard work, and it's lifelong work. It doesn't ever end. I'm never done being sanctified until I hit the other bookend, glorification. When I enter enter eternity, okay, then my sanctified life is complete and I am glorified in the presence of Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand that, that living for Christ is a lifelong responsibility of work, of growing in Christ Jesus. That's why, because it's such hard work, that's why it's so much easier to focus on justification and glorification. I love talking about getting saved and I love talking about heaven. But it's the here and now that's so difficult sometimes. Um, I've, I've, I think I've shared this before with you over, over uh, several years ago. But um, I heard a, a little poem that describes this well, okay? And it, and it so well describes life. To dwell above with the saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know... <laughs> Well, that's quite another story, okay? Living this life can be hard work. The glorified life is wonderful, but this present life can be difficult. And Paul wrote in Philippians 2, and we already studied this a few weeks ago, continue to work out your salvation, for it is God who works in you, that you may become blameless. That's glorification. But the present is sanctification, Continuing to work out your justification, your saved life, is the sanctification process. So, the right posture as a believer is understanding, I'm not there yet. I'm on the journey. I'm on the trip. I'm progressing. But I'm not there yet. And Paul even says, Paul says it, and if you don't have it underlined in your Bibles, you need to. Not that I have already obtained all this. Not that I have already been made perfect. Paul says, I haven't attained this all yet. I am not perfect yet. That's Paul's message. Haven't attained it. 
or that I have been made perfect, I have not accomplished that yet. Now, who is this Paul? He's a guy that met Jesus 30 years ago. 30 years ago. How long does it take, folks? A lifetime. A lifetime. Until you step out of this life and into the next life and are glorified by Jesus Christ. But the sanctified life is a lifetime experience of walking with Christ, growing in Christ, learning from Christ, making mistakes, repenting, confessing, and moving on and upward and pressing on toward the goal that is in Christ Jesus. Somebody wrote it, and it's an unknown person. I might not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay, and I'm on my way. And I want you to know that about every one of us. You can look to the right, you can look to the left, and you can look inside. And you're going to see a person who might not be where they want to be, but thank God they're not where they used to be, as long as that person next to you or inside you has come to know Christ as Savior. You're not what you used to be, but you're not what you're going to be. You're on your way. You're on your way. That is the definition of the sanctified life right there. So the right posture, spiritual exhaustion comes from pretending to be what we are not. Sometimes in the church, we as Christians make it impossible, almost impossible. I'm not going to say impossible, but difficult. We make it difficult for people to be real and true and honest about who they are and where they've been and what they struggle with and what they struggle with today. Oh, I didn't know that about him. <laughs> I didn't know that about her. And I thought they were so righteous. You are righteous if you're in Christ Jesus. I got news for you. You are righteous. Okay, that's the bookend. Justification. But we're on the journey we're on a dusty, dirty road filled with potholes and pitfalls, and difficulties and problems. And I get spiritually exhausted trying to pretend to be what I am not. You see, too often we even expect perfection of ourselves. But we know the truth. But we get up on Sunday morning and we get in the shower and we brush our teeth and we shave and... And we put on makeup if we're women, and we make ourselves look um, uh, spiritual. <laughs> spiritual. And so when everybody comes walking through the door, we all look so good on the outside. Somebody wrote a book, something, I can't remember the exact title, but it's, um, um, Randy, help me out on this. It's, it's um, everybody looks good until you get to know them or something like that. Remember Everybody looks normal, thanks, until you get to know them. Yeah, everybody looks normal until you get to know them. Yeah. <laughs> and we look around sometimes. We look around our church, and we think everybody's normal but me. Why? Because we get to see the inside of me. We just get to see the outside of everybody else. We end up discouraged and exhausted and frustrated, and we lose our joy because we're not what we think we should be. Now, I'm not excusing sin, and please don't hear that from me. But what I am telling you is that Paul says, 30 years I've walked with Jesus, and I'm not perfect yet. 30 years I've walked with Jesus, and I haven't attained my glorification yet. As a matter of fact, in, in the book of Romans, he says, oh man, I struggle with this, I struggle with this. The things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, those things I do. And then he throws up his hands and says, oh, who will save me from this body of sin? You know what he's saying? Who's gonna, who will save me from being a human being on the journey called sanctification? We end up discouraged, exhausted, and frustrated. We end up joyless when we try to be what we think we should be according to the expectations of others. But there's a progress. And by the way, I'm going to tell you this. When I started this sermon, I had four points. 
but knowing that you didn't want to be here when the Romanians arrived at 6 o'clock tonight, I cut this down to two, okay? <laughs> There's a progress. And the progress, Paul says, is take hold of that for which Christ took hold of you. Lay hold of what he's doing. Lay hold of the growth. Lay hold of the sanctification. Lay hold of the journey that you're on. on. Understand that you aren't perfect. Understand that there's a lot of work to be done. Understand that you are a work in progress. Years ago, years ago, um, many, many people went to a seminar called um, Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts by Bill Gothard. Yeah. You still have your red book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we walked around with pins. And, and remember the pin? And I don't remember the P, B. It was all just initials, okay? And it stood for, please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. It was just the first letter from each of those words. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. We used to wear those around. People would say, well, what, what is that? What is that? And it was cool because then you could say, it stands for, please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. See, I'm a work in progress. And Paul understood after 30 years of walking with Jesus, Paul understood after starting churches all over Galatia, all over what it was called Asia Minor, what is Turkey today, after starting churches in, a, in, in, in Europe, after starting churches literally all over the known empire of his day, after leading people to Christ, after preaching to the unsaved, after challenging people, the great philosophers of the day, after training up men and women in the church of Jesus Christ, Paul understood, God isn't done with me yet. I'm not made perfect yet. I'm not there. There, are, there is a doctrinal belief of spiritual perfection, okay? Spiritual perfection, that we can all achieve spiritual perfection one day. Sinless, sinless perfection is what I actually meant to say. Sinless perfection, that we can all grow to the point in this life where we become sinless. And all I have to say is, if you believe that, look in. You don't need to look out. Look in. And be honest about what you see. Paul says, bring every thought captive for Christ Jesus. Have you done that yet? I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. Bringing every thought captive for the cause of Christ. Every thought, every action, every attitude, every word. Sinless perfection. I'm moving in that direction. I'm not where I used to be but I'm not where I'm going to be. But I'm in the process of growing up in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, leave the past in the past. And I really want you to see this. I want you to go back, and let's remember where we were last week, okay? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, regarding to the law of Pharisee for zeal, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Paul has just gone and looked at his past, and we talked about the resume last week. The resume. Legalism requires a resume. And Paul's looking at his resume, and you know what one of the things on Paul's resume is? He was a persecutor of the church. He brought harm to people. He brought harm to people. He caused people to be arrested. He caused people to be imprisoned. He caused people possibly to even be put to death through the legal system of his day. He was a persecutor of the church. Paul says, leave the past in the past. You see, we all have a past. We can all look into our hearts and to our lives. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Let me tell you what I'm glad of right now. I'm glad my past isn't on that slide. I'm glad my past isn't written in a book. I'm glad my past is not a movie from Hollywood. Paul says, leave the past in the past. Humanity deals with the past in, in several different ways. Gene genetically, we excuse ourselves. Well, I'm like my dad and my grandfather, and that's why I do these things, because I inherited it from them. Or, 
if you had my wife, you'd, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. But we, we, tend to, we tend to blame it on, on genetics sometimes. Or how about culture? Well, everybody does it. That's not just a teenage thing, folks. That's a lifetime thing. I excuse me because of you. I excuse me because of what other people are doing, because of what other people are up to. Or how about blame shifting? You ever say something like, you make me so mad? Brad, you make me so mad. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's, it's blame shifting. You can't make me mad. I... I, I decide I'm going to be mad. I have to take responsibility for, for myself on these things, okay? Denial. I'm just not going to think about it anymore. I grew up in a home where that was taught every day. That was my mom's favorite saying. Well, Russell, just don't think about it. <laughs> How do you not think about it? And really, my mom, and my mom was a godly woman, a very saintly woman. But my mom's answer to that would have been, as long as you're not talking about it, then we can all assume you're not thinking about it. And if you're not talking about it, therefore you're not thinking about it. And if you're not thinking about it, therefore you've dealt with the past. Hmm. Doesn't work in my conscience. Doesn't work in my heart. It doesn't work in that time of day when now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> It's amazing what comes out when we're trying to fall asleep on our bed at night. See, none of these are leaving the past behind. So people hide. People deny. People justify. And people ignore. But it doesn't deal with the past. And it's not forgetting the past. Paul didn't do those, folks. Paul says in the text that we're looking at, forgetting those things which are behind. I strain toward what is ahead. What things is he talking about? Forgetting those things which are behind. The things he just listed. Circumcised of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, a persecutor of the church. A person who brings harm, a person who hurts, a person who has destroyed lives. Paul says, that's who I was. That's who I was. Now, I have to ask the question. If Paul says it, if he confesses it here 30 years after the fact again, and then he goes on and says, forget those things which are behind, should he have just not put that in the list? No. No. No, because hiding, denying, justifying, ignoring, those, those don't put any, they don't, they don't put it behind, guys. They leave it fresh, present, active within us. Paul doesn't do any of those things. He admits his past. He says, what I used to do, I'm not doing. I've changed. I've been changed. I met Jesus. Yeah, I used to be a person who hurt people like you. I don't do that anymore. I used to be a person that destroyed lives. I don't do that anymore. I used to be people that got others arrested for nothing other than the fact that they loved Jesus. I don't do that anymore. I used to be an evil, horrid, wicked person. It's not me anymore. I used to be mean. It's not who I am anymore. He admits the past, recognizes the past, and says, forget it, move on. You see, forgetting the past and pressing on is not the same as ignoring the past. And too often, too often, the best counsel, and I'm not saying best, but I mean the, the, the most common counsel that we get is, just don't think about it. Just don't talk about it. Just keep it a secret. Don't tell anybody about it. And if nobody knows, everybody's okay, and you're okay. The problem is, I haven't dealt with it, and it eats at me. 
and it eats like a cancer. And it eats and destroys. And it eats and steals my joy. And it eats and it causes me exhaustion because I talk to people and they think I'm so perfect. And I teach Sunday school and they all think I'm so smart and so perfect. And I preach sermons and they think I'm so perfect. And I raise kids and they think I'm so perfect. And I belong to all these committees and they all think I'm so perfect. And all I've done is ignored the past, denied the past. But I haven't forgotten it. It's alive in me and it's alive and well in me. Forgetting the past in the Greek. Epilanthonomai. Epi means on top of. Anthonomai, what has been set aside. Paul says, forget the past. And what he says about what, what that means is, on top of the things that you've set aside, this is who I am, this is who I was, but it's not who I am. This is who I am now, but this is who I was. And on top of where I was, I move on in Christ Jesus. You know a person has properly set aside the past when they can talk about it without being gripped by fear and shame and embarrassment. The truth is, folks, we all make mistakes. The truth is, we all have sinned. The truth, truth is, we've all done things if we had it to do over again, we sure wish we wouldn't have done. We've all disobeyed Christ Jesus. We've all disappointed our Lord. That's the truth. And you know that a person has properly dealt with the past when they can talk about the past without being gripped by fear and shame and embarrassment because they have been forgiven. They've been forgiven. See, Paul was a cruel, evil man. And he says, I was. Not anymore. I was. That's who I was. But now forgetting the past, I press on in Christ Jesus. Some people believe he committed murder. I don't. I don't because if you study everything the Bible says about him, he will tell you that he turned people over for, pers for, for prosecution. He persecuted people and turned them over for prosecution. Never tells us that he took those kind of matters into his own hands. But no matter how you slice it, he was an evil man. We know that he was a persecutor, and the word persecute in the Greek means to pursue with the intent of harming in a spirit of hostility. The great joy robber. The great joy robber is never having dealt properly with the past so that you can forget what's behind and press on toward the goal. What's in your past? How do I know? How do I know that Paul dealt with it? He can talk he can talk about where he was and where he is and where he's going. He can say, before I got justified, here I was. Then I met Jesus. But he's not even saying now that I've met Jesus. Now that I've met Jesus, he's not even saying now I'm perfect. He's not saying that. He's saying I'm still working. Still progressing. Still advancing still being sanctified daily. You see, to those who live in freedom and joy and rest, those who live in freedom and joy and rest live in honesty with where we were, where we are, and where we're going. Covering up who we really are is exhausting. Now let me be real honest with you. I got married in 1971 to Dorothy. Some of you remember Dorothy. Dorothy was pregnant. Did I say that from the pulpit? We went off to Bible college. By the way, I stayed married to her until she died. We went off to Bible college. God called us into the ministry. And I have to share my experience. Because there came a time, some years later, when I had to sit before a licensing committee. Now, I have to describe them to you and two characteristics come to mind. Number one, they were historic, which means they were older than dirt. <laughs> and number two, they were stoic, 
which means they had never smiled in their entire lives. <laughs> I can't forget the experience 40 years ago. They all sat in a circle with me there. And in their hands was all of my documentation. Because I had to fill out pages and pages and pages of documentation. Everything in my life was on this paperwork. And the historic Stoic committee was questioning me on doctrine and church practice and everything you can imagine from Genesis to maps. And then I remember one of the guys, old Mel Hall. <laughs> Mel is sitting there with my paperwork. And there's a pause. And Mel's looking at this. And he looks up at me. And he says, Russell, I see that you were married January 31st, 1971. I mean, excuse me, July 31st, 1971. <laughs> I remember that date. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm thinking so far so good. And then he says, I see your first son was born February 4th, 1972. I spoke not a word, hung my head. His eyes pierced through me, and he said, people can do the math. I said nothing. It was deathly silent in that room. Everybody was doing the math. Well, I got accepted, I got licensed, and I went into ministry. And you know what we did? We didn't tell anybody when we were married. You know why? Because they could do the math. So Dorothy and I had a very effective ministry. We pastored churches and they grew and people were saved and people were baptized and great things happened. But we never told anybody what our anniversary date was. And when we were married nine years, we would tell people it was 10. But we preferred not to talk about it at all. Now I'm going to tell you something. I've never in my life experienced anything more exhausting than trying to be what I knew I wasn't. And I never talked about it. And I never dealt with it. And I never conquered it. And even though I never talked about it, never dealt with it, never conquered it, it wasn't behind me. I hadn't forgotten it. Let me tell you, it was present and alive and eating at my joy. And now I'm going to stand before you and I'm going to tell you something. It's not where I am, folks. It's not where I am. It's where I was, but it's not where I am. And it's not where I'm going. Because Jesus forgave me. And I sat down with my oldest son one day. And I don't want anybody to think that I am justifying premarital sexual relations. I'm not. Take it from me. There's a lot of guilt that goes with it. But I sat down with my oldest son one day because I wanted to have the discussion with him. And I talked. And I shared. And I shared my experience and my hurt and my shame and my guilt. And my old son Dave, he was very kind to me. And he listened to every word I had to say. And when I got done, he looked at me and said, Dad, let me tell you something. I'm not going to excuse what you did. But if you wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here. Hmm. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that ever. 
See, God's the creator of life. I might have had a bad motive, but God was the creator of life. And my son is a precious, godly man who loves Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. I've forgotten the past, and I've moved on. And you have passed too. You have passed too. And sometimes it's my kind of past. Maybe it's a crime. Maybe it's an abortion. Maybe it's adultery. Maybe it's disrespecting parents, rebellion, drugs, alcohol. And you've always kept it a secret. And I'm not going to say that we go out and blab all of our news all over the world. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying this to you. We all have a past just like the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul says, I was a bad man. But not anymore. Not anymore. And I'm going to tell you that with Paul, I'm going to tell you, I made mistakes in life and sinned. But I've moved on in Jesus. I'm not perfect, but I'm working my way to glorification. And Paul says, by the way, verse 15, if you wonder what that means, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. Paul's saying, if you're mature in Christ Jesus, you need to have that view. You can talk about your past because you've forgotten it and you've moved on. I had a video, but I'm not going to show it, Dylan. I just want everybody to look into their heart today and say, have I really moved on? Have I really moved on? I want you to know that in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and that means your sins are forgiven. In Christ Jesus, your past is gone, and that means your past is gone. When Paul wrote that we are in Christ Jesus, a new creation. The word used in the Greek for new means new in a form that never existed before. Never existed before. You aren't who you used to be. You aren't who you're going to be. But you're on the right road in Christ Jesus. And I believe that the greatest joy in life comes from being able to stand up and say, this is who I am, and this is where I am, and this is what Jesus Christ has done for me. There's joy. No hiding, no denying. Messed up? Yep, messed up. No excuses. But now, I'm forgiven. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for Paul and being so honest looking at his past and what was there. And Lord, help us. Help us to deal with those things that we as the church can be so condemning of one another in. We've made mistakes. We've made horrible choices. Terrible decisions. But Lord, if we've confessed those to you, then we have been forgiven, and that's not where we are. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sets us free, and I thank you. I thank you that we can press on toward the future. We can press upward and onward in Christ Jesus, knowing you don't hold our past against us. We ought not. I'm just going to ask this morning for every head to remain bowed and every eye closed. And I'm going to ask for an actual response. And it is this. If you understand what I'm talking about, and there's something in your past, if you, you've never really been able to set aside, nobody's looking around. Nobody cares. But I want to pray for you. And, and you're saying, man, Russell, I, I know what you're talking about. I've been there. I know the exhaustion. I know the struggle. Would you just lift your hand up and put it down quickly? And I'm going to pray for you in closing. Yeah, I see hands all over this sanctuary. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Yes, thank you. Heavenly Father, you've seen these hands go up. These hands weren't raised to me. They were raised to you. Lord Jesus, you know, you know the need that's behind it. 
You know the hurt? You know the shame? You know the exhaustion? And Lord, I pray that you would, first of all, remind every one of us that we're a family and we love one another. And we're a family who doesn't expect perfection. Oh, yeah, we, we expect it in ourselves more than others a lot of times. But we're not perfect. We're being made perfect, but we're not there. And I pray, Lord, for these hands that were represented, for healing, for forgiveness, for shame to be removed, for confidence in the fact it's what I did, but it's not who I am, and it's not where I am, and it's not where I'm going. Set us free, Lord. Set us free. Help us to lay aside this exhaustion of carrying around a lie and be free in Christ Jesus and filled with the joy that comes from being honest and truthful in your presence. In Jesus' name.